So here's what I understand of our policy with China at the moment. China, communist, bad guys, Captain Australia will join Captain America to save the world. I mean, I'll be very concerned if this is the limit of our understanding of our largest trading partner and our second largest economy in the world. And worse, we're jumping into an arms race because of it. I actually think ABC's China Tonight made more effort to understand China than DFAT. So why isn't DFAT investing the same level of attention and resources to building a comprehensive relationship with China than with the United States? How much of China we actually understand or know given we and our allies have been wrong in the past about China? Joey, thank you for those kind words about China tonight. <laughs> We're very proud of the show as well here at, at, uh, at the ABC. I want to go to Chris Barry first of all on this. And Chris, China wasn't mentioned today by any of the leaders by name, but there's no doubt in your mind, is it, that that's exactly what we were talking about? Look, I, I think the whole question is around the deterioration in our strategic circumstances on one hand and how we deal with uh, a major rising power like China on the other. But uh, to go to the point of Joey's question, if we're not using every element of our national power to try and avoid going to war, war instead of jaw, jaw, then we're making a very serious mistake. And that's what really worries me, that we sleepwalk now into the possibility of another war. Yeah, can I just start with you on that, Chris, though? Because, of course, there are, there are two sides to this. And we know from China and from Xi Jinping, he has talked precisely about war. He talks about being able to build a military capable of winning such a war and has made threats to invade Taiwan to reunify it with the mainland. Yeah, I think that's part of the problem, though, isn't it? Um, to go back to where I started this about uh, six years ago, you know, in the lead-up to the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War, I did the reading in The Sleepwalkers by Christopher mm. Clark at uh, Cambridge University. Uh, and Margaret Millen's book on the peace that ended... Uh, the war that ended the peace. And, 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 you know, what really strikes you is the similarity between the last great age of globalisation between 1895 and 1914 uh, and the signs of conditions we're now going through. So we're seeing, you know, a courageous uh, announcement by the Australian government today to, to go for nuclear uh, propulsion in our submarine fleet. You've seen the last uh, 2020 defence update announce that we're getting more and more concerned about uh, how we're going to deal with the whole question of rising China. Uh, and you've seen now on the stage the quad, uh, as well as these new arrangements that were announced today. So, you know, I just hope that we don't lack the strategic imagination to think there's a different set of outcomes here. And that's why I go back to my point. Mm. I hope all the elements of our national power are being used to try and make sure we never do have to go to war. Dave Sharma, you've talked up um, nuclear-powered submarines before. Why was this necessary? It is, it is an extraordinary step, isn't it? Look, I, it's absolutely a big step for Australia's defence capabilities. We've never had it before. The main reason why... Well, there's it's... only six nations in the world that do have this capacity and every single one of them have nuclear weapons and a nuclear power um, capacity as well. This, this, this is a, a, a crossing a real threshold. It's a big step, although I think South Korea is in the process of acquiring nuclear submarines and they, they don't have nuclear weapons, they do have nuclear power. Look, look, the main reason is because of our strategic circumstances. Um, the nature of our geography and where we need our submarines to operate means that when we were using diesel-powered submarines, it was suboptimal for the sorts of things we need a submarine to do. We need a submarine to be able to loiter at sea undetected for long periods. We need a submarine to be able to operate a long way from home. We need a submarine to be able to travel fast if need be. Uh, all of these things, a nuclear propulsed submarine does much better than a diesel powered one. Um, so I think this is a recognition that um, our circumstances are such that we need to um, acquire this capability. I just make the point here mm. with our Air Force, we've always acquired the most capable aircraft of its generation. We're currently acquiring um, the Joint Strike Fighter. It's a fifth generation aircraft. It's the top of the top of the line model. Um, for some reason with submarines, we've never chosen to do that. We've always said we're going to have a conventionally powered one. I think all we're doing now is bringing our submarine capability in line with our other power projection capabilities. But John Lee, there has been a dramatic 
shift. It wasn't that long ago we were signing a deal with France and it wasn't for nuclear-powered <laughs> submarines. Um, we've increased our military spending. All of the leaders today talked about the threats in the Indo-Pacific. What does it tell us about the trajectory that we are on now and the potential, the real potential, for conflict with China? All this has happened, the increase in military spending by Australia, the focus of the United States on the Indo-Pacific and other countries like Japan, even the United Kingdom, that is all a response to what China is doing. Um, if you look at the last 30 years, and if the Chinese leaders say this, you have to believe them, they've been preparing for war for the last 30 years. Uh, for the last 30 years, they've engaged in the most rapid uh, rearming in peacetime in history. And not, it's not just about the capability, they've told us exactly what they want to achieve. It's not just Taiwan. Uh, they, want to, uh, they want a far greater presence in the East China Sea and they want a dominance of the South China Sea. Uh, so what we're seeing, the announcement today, but, but the events for the last few years in terms of where Australia and other countries have gone, uh, in, in national politics, every time uh, a country uh, takes these sorts of policies, there's always a response, and that is the response that we have. On the issue of conflict and war, I would say this, that we are sleeping our way towards a war if we do nothing about mm. it. The only way to prevent a war is to deter, because China is advancing. And the only way to deter China is to convince China that it would be a collective disaster imposed on China uh, should China provoke a war. Now, I know these are quite blunt and harsh words, but this is the reality of our regional situation. Um, and I would say that there is a far greater chance of peace if we are in a position to make things extremely difficult for China should it, uh, uh, should it decide on certain courses of action. Linda Burney, Labor has given some conditional support yes. to this. Interesting comments today from former Prime Minister Paul Keating, though, saying that this is basically selling out Australian sovereignty and saying that we should be looking at a more independent approach. Do you agree with him on this? Uh, Labor's position, as you, st as you say, Stan, is conditional. And it goes to nuclear weapons and it goes to the non-proliferation uh, treaty which Australia is a signatory to. Um, the, the, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that we're signatory to says that we should take all steps um, to eradicate nuclear weapons. How does that fit with now developing nuclear-powered capacity? Subject? Well, it fits within the Labor platform, which we've been very careful about today. Uh, the, my understanding is that the submarine deal, and let's remember it's the third one, not the second one. There was Japan mm. and then there was uh, France and, and now um, America, uh, is, is nuclear propulsion. Um, so our, our agreement to the policy is very conditional. But let's remember, Stan, that this is not going to happen till nine, uh, 2040 mm. and then there's one year for three years, as I understand. I'll be dead before this is rolled out, quite oh, I wouldn't frankly. Be, I wouldn't be risking <laughs> that too quickly. <laughs> um, and the other, the other point that's really important, um, and I'm surprised there hasn't been more commentary on this, is that we've spent $90 billion already on the attack submarine deal, and who knows what the compensation is not, going to not, be not, not quite. Just, to just, France. Just, just quickly, Dave, we have to move on to our next question. I think no. it's about, I think it's what, about 400 million? Look, $90 billion was the cost of acquiring 12 and operating 12. But but if we Which you told us that. you were still doing a month ago. But I think the announcement today yeah. made clear that we're Super not going